Hi friends, last winter at a flea market I bought an old transformer charger for car batteries. I showed this charger in one of the videos about the finds at the flea market. I liked its case, but I decided to throw out all the stuffing from there and assemble a new one, completely from the beginning. This is a factory charger UZ-1 which provided a charging current of up to 10 amperes. It's built on mains iron transformer supplemented by a thruster phase pulse power controller. It didn't have any protections, but there is a spacious metal case, a reliable switch and a huge arrow indicator of the charge current. I immediately decided that I would keep the future charger for myself. It will not be a gift to somebody as it happened with my previous chargers. This project was delayed due to laziness, but nevertheless it was completed and today I will tell you about it. The charger is unusual, it is stuffed with protections and is very reliable. It is extremely difficult to burn such a one. To begin with, I will point out that it has protection against incorrect battery connection, protection against short circuits and automatic shutdown when the battery is fully charged. Of course, it is possible to adjust the charge current, although the current isn't stabilized here. There is a power indicator, a battery connection error indicator and a charge end indicator. The charging current is regulated quite smoothly from 3 to 30 to 35 amps, but you can pull it out for a short time up to 50 amps by selecting just one component in the circuit. But we will talk about this later. The maximum charging current is enough to charge very capacious batteries from trucks. The user can manually turn off the automation and there is a corresponding toggle switch for this. If you turn off the automation, you lose all protections and you will simply have a phase pulse controller. Why did you need a toggle switch to turn off protections? After all, without them you can burn everything. The fact is that the automation system is involved. There will be no voltage at the output of the device until you connect the battery. That is, it is impossible to check any light bulbs with this charger and by turning off the automation system, you have such an opportunity. I already talked in detail how this circuit works in another video. It can be viewed via the link in the description. In terms of characteristics and reliability, this charger will give odds to many factory ones. Firstly, there is no savings here. It was assembled with expensive components simply because there was such an opportunity. All the components were bought at a flea market at one time or another literally for next to nothing, well, except for the winding wire. This can be said not just a charger, but a charger and starter. It can help the battery start the engine. Yes, you can connect it to the battery in parallel and torture it as much as you want. For this it was created, although I don't even have a car. Let's start with the control system. I upgraded the Resource 1 charger circuit. It provides adjustment and has an automation system. This upgrade allows you to use one power thruster and four diodes instead of two thrusters and two diodes, which were used in the original circuit. Also, all components were replaced with modern ones and an indicator of incorrect connection of battery was added. The board is factory, all so beautiful, purple, these boards were ordered from our long-term sponsor GLCPCB, which is able to produce printed circuit boards of any size and shape within reason, from simple single-sided and double-sided to complex multi-layer ones. The company also offers services for industrial 3D printing, the creation of soldering stencils for soldering SMD components, and the assembly of circuit. All these services have acceptable prices if you don't take into account the cost of delivery. The link to the company's website is in the description. You will not have any problems with the operation of this node. By the way, in the description there is an archive of the project. There you will find two versions of the printed circuit boards, both with one tracer and with two, as well as a folder with the name Gerber. This is for ordering boards at the factory. The only thing that is required of you after assembling the board is to set the auto off voltage value. That voltage depends on the type of your battery. Connect the plus and minus of the board to a laboratory source and set it at the voltage to which your battery should be charged. Then slowly rotate the trimmer resistor on the board until you achieve the operation of the LED. This completes the adjustment. At the end, it is desirable to steal the trimmer screw. There will also be no problems connecting the board because everything is signed on it. The power rectifier is a diode bridge. In my case, two diode modules were used. 
connected according to the full bridge circuit. You can use ready-made diode bridges like KBPC5010 or assemble a bridge of four diodes. In my case, 40 amp MDD40 modules for 800 volts were used just because they were available, but this was with their large excess in voltage. The modules were installed on a fairly large heatsink through thermal paste. Their substrate is insulated from the diodes themselves, so there is no need for additional insulation. The modules are connected by a thick, tinned copper bus. The power thyristor is installed on the same radiator. The thyristor anode has an electrical connection with the radiator. On the anode we will have a minus. For safety reasons, so that this minus doesn't appear on the device case, the radiator is screwed to the case through plastic racks. My thyristor is for 50 amps. Given that these components have a power reserve, 50 amps isn't the limit for it. A few words about how to expand the range of current adjustment. This is done by selecting the specified components. You need to remember one thing. Here is no stabilization and therefore depending on the transformer you used, the output current can be adjusted in a different range when using the same components. Therefore, in my case, in order to obtain an adjustment in the range from 3 to 30 to 35 amps, the indicated resistor was replaced with 15 kilo ohm. The lower the resistance R19, the greater the upper limit of the output current and vice versa. The ammeter shunt for 75 amps also bolted to the chases through insulators. Further, the power unit was postponed and the epic with the transformer began. A torus is used as a core, everyone knows about its advantages. On a smaller size, it packs more power, is more reliable and has a better current voltage characteristics, but it's dim and hard to wind by hand. The overall power of the iron of this torus is about 600 watts. I bought iron at a flea market. The primary winding wire was available, but I had to buy the secondary winding wire. The primary winding was wound with different wires. Part of it was wound with copper with a diameter of 1 mm, the other part with a double wire of 0.6 mm. The minimum section of this winding is 0.57 square mm. The winding was done evenly, neatly, interlayer insulation consists of several layers of varnished fabric. The power or secondary winding is also wound with a copper wire with a diameter of 1.4 mm in three cores. The total cross section of this winding is about 4.6 square mm, but the thickness of varnish wasn't taken on account. The torus is screwed to the case through sheets of thick textilite in order to avoid the windings damage rubber sheets put under the textilite. On the secondary winding, the voltage is about 20 volts. There is a 5 amp fuse at the 220 volt input. The original pointer indicator is at 10 amps and given that there are already more currents and the shunt is different, the scale had to be first calibrated, then scanned and made a new one. The new scale is capable of showing currents up to 30 amps quite accurately. In general, the working area will be currents up to 10 amps because no one will charge a car battery with such huge currents. The specified 30 amps can be safe supplied for a long time, so trucks can also be charged in a reasonable time period. All wiring is copper. Power wires are stranded for 8 squares. All power and non-power connections are made using tinned copper terminals, that is, everything is serious and according to the canons. The original case wasn't subjected to any upgrades, except for the fact that several holes were drilled. The old paint was completely removed and then a new paint job was done. I have never been able to paint normally and this time was no exception. But in my defense, I will say that all this was painted in winter and I didn't have favorable conditions for such a job. As a result, I can say that the charger turned out to be quite good, reliable, but bulky. Yes, something needs to be sacrificed. If you use it wisely and use the manual mode only when absolutely necessary, then this is an indestructible thing. Of course, it doesn't have those bells and whistles that modern chargers are complemented with, but it is a quite suitable device today. The shape of the output signal from such a charge isn't a pure constant. They say that such a current can help in the desulfation of batteries. Naturally, it is much more reliable than modern chargers. 
Among the shortcomings, I note large size and weight, high cost, lack of current and voltage stabilization modes. In general, I'm satisfied with the work done. In the end, let me remind you once again that in the archive of this project, which can be downloaded from the link in the description, you can find printed circuit boards, Gerber files, and a circuit of this charger. In the same description, there will be other useful information and links to my other resources. That's all today, and I say bye until we meet again. As always, with you was Kaysan TV.